Frederick Dannon. Hit men. Power brokers and fast money inside the music business. Music doesn't just appear out of thin air. Each song travels a complex path from the studio to your ears. This path is more complicated and dramatic than it seems at first glance. Behind every track stand larger-than-life personalities, high-stakes gambles, and sometimes shady dealings. An industry revolution. It's the late 1960s, and the music industry is undergoing a massive transformation. Rock and roll, once dismissed as a teenage craze, is growing into a powerful cultural movement. Albums are becoming more important than singles, and a new generation of socially conscious listeners are rallying around artists like Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane, and The Grateful Dead. Amid this shift, Clive Davis began his rise in the music world. As a young lawyer-turned-executive at CBS Records, he was one of the few who understood the growing impact of rock music. In 1967, when he took the reins of CBS, a label primarily known for easy listening and show tunes, Davis boldly steered it into the rock revolution. His vision transformed CBS into the most successful and influential record company by the early 1970s. Davis often pointed to the 1967 Monterey Pop Festival as the moment that opened his eyes to the potential of rock. After being blown away by Janis Joplin and other performers, he sent his legal team to San Francisco to sign the best new acts. Within a year, CBS had secured deals with Big Brother and The Holding Company, Santana, Chicago and others. These signings paid off quickly. Big Brother's album Cheap Thrills went gold, and the second albums from Santana and Chicago became hits. Blood, Sweat and Tears, another band Davis brought on board, sold in massive numbers. By 1970, CBS's profits had tripled, and their market share had grown significantly. Feeling confident, Davis embarked on an aggressive strategy of signing major artists from other labels. He landed deals with Neil Diamond, Pink Floyd and Herbie Hancock, including a massive $4.25 million contract for Diamond. Davis believed CBS's distribution network could handle the expense, and he was right. The company kept growing. Over time, Davis's ego grew as large as the stars he worked with. Not everyone was happy with his methods, though. Davis's habit of spending big on advances and perks annoyed CBS's accountants, and his combative attitude wore down his staff. Rumours circulated that his instincts for picking hits were not always as sharp as he claimed. By 1973, tensions between Davis and CBS management, particularly with new president Arthur Taylor, were escalating. After years of growth, CBS records hit a rough patch, and the pressure on Davis mounted. In May of that year, his time at CBS came to a sudden end when he was fired over allegations of financial misconduct, charges he denied, but that led to further legal trouble. With Davis gone, CBS Records faced a period of uncertainty. To restore stability, the company turned to an unlikely leader, Walter Yetnikoff, a quiet lawyer with a very different style from Davis. Bidding Wars and Power Plays Yetnikov's leadership marked the beginning of a new era, one defined by bold, deal-driven executives. He soon shared his quiet demeanour, adopting a larger-than-life persona and setting his sights on surpassing Warner Communications, CBS's biggest rival. One of his first big moves came in 1976, when he snagged James Taylor from Warner Brothers Records with a massive million-dollar-per-album contract. It almost fell apart when Taylor showed up late to the signing, deeply shaken after Warner executives made a last-ditch effort to keep him. Yetnikov, furious and holding both the contract and a $2.5 million check, eventually persuaded Taylor to sign in the early hours of the morning. Warner's Mo Austin soon hit back by signing Paul Simon, one of CBS's top artists. For Yetnikov, it was a stinging defeat. He had never liked Simon, and the loss made it worse. He was even angrier with Simon's lawyer, but his anger cooled when he learned the same attorney now represented Billy Joel. This back and forth led to fierce bidding wars between CBS and Warner, 
with both companies throwing huge amounts of money at established stars. As this rivalry escalated, costs skyrocketed. CBS signed artists like Paul McCartney and the Beach Boys in deals that often lost money. One particularly controversial deal saw McCartney given the valuable Frank Loser song catalogue, upsetting CBS's own publishing division. Many inside the company lamented this shift in focus, remembering a time when CBS was known for nurturing artists rather than simply buying them. The feud between Yetnikoff and Austin reached absurd heights during the battle over the band Boston. Their third album was delayed due to the perfectionism of leader Tom Schultz, which led to a massive $60 million lawsuit from CBS. When Schultz tried to leave for MCA, Yetnikoff reportedly teamed up with David Geffen and MCA's Irving Azoff to block the move. Despite their personal animosities, these three industry titans worked together in what became an unstoppable force in the business, but they were just as likely to turn on each other as to collaborate. These power struggles symbolised a shift in the industry. The old guard of refined record men was replaced by tough, relentless negotiators. Geffen and Azoff, who had come from artist management, rose to become industry heavyweights. Deals were no longer sealed with a handshake. They were hammered out in tense, sometimes explosive negotiations. Under Yetnikov's leadership, CBS Records moved away from cultivating new talent, instead focusing on acquiring established artists at any cost. By the early 80s, Yetnikov had cemented his reputation as the king of deal-making, forever changing the record industry's landscape. Breaking the promotion machine By the turn of the decade, CBS had hit tough times, especially after a rough 1979. Earnings had nearly halved, and the company needed to make cuts. One major area of spending was independent promotion, where millions were being funneled into the hands of middlemen to secure radio airplay. This is where Dick Asher, the deputy president of CBS Records, stepped in with a daring idea. Try breaking a single on Top 40 radio without using these independent promoters. Asher wasn't your typical music industry figure. He was a sharp, strategic thinker, an ex-Marine with a law degree from Cornell. In 1980, Asher decided to tackle one of the music industry's biggest financial leaks, the dependence on independent promotion. These promoters had immense power, controlling access to radio playlists. Record labels, including CBS, had spent millions to ensure their artists got airplay, and by 1985, the industry was bleeding 60 to $80 million a year just on this practice. Asher decided to test his theory with Pink Floyd's Another Brick in the Wall, Part 2. The song came from The Wall album, which was already hugely successful. Pink Floyd didn't need Top 40 Radio to sell records. They were a band that thrived on album-oriented rock stations. But Asher wanted to see if they could get the song to the top of LA's competitive Top 40 market without relying on independent promoters. The timing seemed right. The band was about to kick off their highly anticipated Wall Tour in Los Angeles, and tickets were flying off the shelves. It made sense to assume that the buzz around the tour would be enough to force radio stations to play the song. Yet, despite the song's national success and the excitement in LA, none of the four major top 40 stations in the city would play it. It wasn't just a case of radio stations not liking the song. Asher soon realised that the real obstacle was The Network, a group of independent promoters operating like a cartel. They controlled which songs made it onto playlists, and in Los Angeles they were sending a clear message. No airplay without payment. With LA radio stations refusing to play the track, Asher had no choice but to give in. Once CBS hired the independent promoters, things changed immediately. Another brick in the wall shot up the charts in Los Angeles within days, proving how much power these promoters had. Asher's experiment failed, but it revealed a harsh truth. The real power in the industry wasn't with the artists or even the labels. It was with the behind-the-scenes promoters who controlled access to the airwaves, demanding their cut to open those doors. Triumph and Excess Dick Asher and Walter Yetnikoff had a long history at CBS Records, 
with Asher serving as a loyal lieutenant during Yetnikov's rise to the top. Despite the setback with independent promoters, Asher's cost-cutting measures were largely successful in the early 80s. He trimmed excessive spending, renegotiated contracts and streamlined operations across the company. However, as CBS's fortunes turned around, a power struggle emerged between Asher and Yetnikov. The latter found his position strengthened by alliances with two influential figures. The first was Frank DeLeo, Epic Records' vice president of promotion, who became a close confidant. When DeLeo orchestrated the massively successful thriller campaign for Michael Jackson, his stock soared even higher. On the personal front, Yetnikov's life was undergoing seismic changes. His marriage fell apart as he began a high-profile relationship with Linda Boom Boom Imon, a younger woman whose brash style both captivated and concerned many at CBS. Imon's presence at industry events and lavish parties she hosted with Yetnikov became a source of controversy. Meanwhile, the long-simmering tensions between Yetnikov and Asher finally erupted in 1983. Despite Asher's success in engineering a financial turnaround, Yetnikov blindsided him with the news that CEO Tom Wyman wanted him gone. In a stunning turn of events, Asher was abruptly fired in April 1983, ending his 17-year tenure at CBS. The industry's response to Asher's termination was largely cold, with Epic even celebrating with a champagne party. Yetnikov, meanwhile, reveled in his consolidated power. He pulled off a flashy but expensive coup by signing the Rolling Stones and threw himself an over-the-top 50th birthday bash. By the end of 1983, CBS Records was posting record profits, largely thanks to Asher's cost-cutting initiatives, initiatives that Yetnikov now claimed credit for. Yetnikov's triumph seemed complete at the Grammy Awards when he joined Michael Jackson on stage, a powerful public display of his unmatched industry clout. As Yetnikov's star rose, Asher found himself cast out in the cold. Struggling to find a new position, he was shocked by how CBS had callously handled his termination. Many of Asher's former allies at CBS were soon ousted as well in what appeared to be a coordinated purge. Yetnikov had emerged victorious in his brutal battle with Asher, but storm clouds were gathering. CBS Records was increasingly reliant on expensive artist deals, Independent promoters continued to flex their muscles, and Yetnikov's own behaviour was becoming more erratic. The fall of Dick Asher marked the end of an era and the beginning of an uncertain new chapter. It remained to be seen whether Yetnikov's empire, built on audacious deal-making and personal excess, could endure the mounting challenges on the horizon. The Fall of an Empire in October 1985, Polygram was struggling to regain its footing after years of heavy losses. Company head Jan Timmer made a surprising choice for the new president of Polygram's US operation, Dick Asher. After taking the reins, Asher began the painful process of slashing costs and rebuilding the company. He trimmed the bloated artist roster, closed warehouses, and brought in his own team, many of them former CBS colleagues. Thanks to the heavy metal craze and breakout success of bands like Bon Jovi, Polygram began to turn things around. At the same time, the record industry was struggling with the skyrocketing costs of independent promotion. Promoters such as Joe Isgro and Fred DiCipio, referred to as indies, were charging millions to secure radio airplay for songs, pushing smaller labels out of the competition. The industry's own greed and aggressive methods had unleashed a problem that was now beyond their control. In February 1986, NBC News aired a bombshell report exposing the cosy relationship between indie promoters and organised crime. Hidden camera footage showed Isgro and DiCipio meeting with Mafia boss John Gotti and his lieutenants before schmoozing at a lavish industry gala. The implications were explosive. Overnight, the major labels severed ties with the indies, terrified of the PR nightmare. Isgro saw his empire crumbling and lashed out, filing a $75 million lawsuit against the labels for antitrust violations. 
but his days as a power broker were numbered. As the dust settled, the labels found a new way to get their songs played by funneling money through artist managers and tour support. In other words, the cost of promotion was now charged against the musicians' own royalties. The indies were sidelined, but the pay-for-play system lived on. Over at CBS, Walter Yetnikoff was fighting his own battles. Brash and intimidating, Yetnikoff clashed repeatedly with new CBS chief Larry Tish. Tensions boiled over in an expletive-filled confrontation in which Yetnikoff slammed his fist and threatened to get physical if Tish kept trying to push him around. Desperate to unshackle CBS from Tish's micromanaging, Yetnikoff orchestrated a blockbuster sale of the company in 1988 to Sony for two billion dollars. The deal made him vastly wealthy, but also turned him into a ticking time bomb. His drinking spiralled out of control until he finally checked into rehab in 1989. When he emerged proclaiming himself a changed man, it quickly became clear that sobriety had done little to tame his self-destructive impulses. Yetnikov's behaviour grew more erratic and offensive by the day. He made crude, homophobic remarks about David Geffen. He viciously insulted his Japanese bosses and feuded openly with Sony's newly acquired film studio. He shredded his relationships with Bruce Springsteen and Michael Jackson, two of CBS's most important artists. By 1990, Yetnikov was a lame duck. His power diminished, his corporate goodwill squandered. That September, Sony abruptly announced his departure. After 15 tumultuous years, the most infamous record man of his generation had orchestrated his own downfall, burning every bridge on his way out the door. Yetnikov's downfall signalled the close of a chapter in the music industry. As the 1990s began, the business encountered fresh challenges, with evolving technologies and shifting consumer behaviours transforming the landscape. The extravagance of the 80s was replaced by a more corporate-driven environment, yet the experiences of the past, both positive and negative, would continue to shape the industry's trajectory.